Well, good morning. How you doing? Are you good? Ah, some of you are. I am great. Thanks for asking. Um, I, I did something very Canadian, actually very Niagara. I, I went to Mexico for a week. I, I, I saw you guys doing it for 18 years. I thought I should try it. And now I know why. It's pretty amazing. And I really know I'm from Niagara because when I was down there, they had those people going up and down the beach selling hawking stuff. And I'm like, I'm not buying any of that. Until a guy came, legit, this is legit, a Mexican blanket with a Toronto Maple Leafs logo. Like, I, I had to buy it. I just had to buy it. So yes, it is in my house. I, I, that's what I knew. I, I am Niagara, people. I am Niagara. And uh, we're so glad that you're here too. Whether you came uh, for a baby dedication, as a friend, family member, uh, whatever, we're so glad that you are here. My name is Bill. I'm the lead pastor. And we've really tried to create a space where it's really safe for you to explore the questions about God and about yourself and about what really matters. Now, today I want to start with a confession. Uh, most of my life, I have felt like I don't really fit. And I used to think I was kind of weird or odd. I, it was because I think differently than a lot of people. Um, and then I realized, well, that's actually kind of a strength. We're all unique and we're all different. And then I realized that actually, the more I talk to people, the more of us actually feel the exact same way. Like, we can be in a room full of people, but we don't really feel like maybe we fully belong or we, we're connected. And we can be in a, a relationship and it just doesn't seem to click, and often we can feel like we're the outside looking in. Now, for me, I think part of it was my experience. So I grew up traveling all of my life. Um, I went to seven different schools in four different cities, and so it was really hard adjusting into those new environments, and every one of those schools, of course, has its own culture, its own way of doing things, fashion, all that stuff, and so I was always trying to fit in and never felt like I did. And this was really emphasized in my one of my junior high school transitions. Um, I went to a new school, and they posted up all over that, uh, that week that it was a spirit week, and that on the Friday, everybody was going to dress up, you know, to show school spirit. And so the colors were blue and red, and I kind of forgot about it, didn't really think much about it until Friday morning. And I woke up in a bit of a panic, because I was thinking, okay, no, 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 I saw these posters, and... Everyone's going to be dressed up, and I'm not, and it's going to just re-emphasize that I don't fit, I don't belong, so i got to do something really quick. Um, never make a, a decision in panic. It's always a bad idea. Um, but, but, but my grandmother lived with us at the time, and so no one else was at home, so I went to my grandmother, and I said, you got to help me. i got to get dressed up. It's a spirit week. I'm trying to explain it to her, and she's like, okay, no problem. So she goes into her, into her room, and she goes into her underwear drawer. Now, now... <laughs> Just a word of wisdom here. Um, when grandma goes to the underwear drawer, run. Like, just like that. Grandma and underwear drawer, just no, that, no, run. But I didn't. So she pulls out this pair of old stockings, leg stockings. And she goes, here, put this on your head. Um, I, was, I was desperate. I needed a costume. Okay, I'll put it on my head. And then we put like little perfection pieces. There was this game. And so... It, I looked like a freak. Anyway, so, so I'm going to school. I'm dressed up for spirit day. You'd think I would have clued in um, when I went to the bus station and people were like walking away from me. Like, um, I, I got tripped twice getting onto the bus and no one would sit with me. Now, now, here's how bad it was. I was completely clueless. I had no idea that whole day that whole day, when I got to school, this is the other thing. You'd think I would have looked around and said, hey, nobody else is dressed up. So I should take it off. But I didn't. I didn't. That day, this is, I know it's painful, but go ahead. You can laugh at me. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, I laugh at myself now. Um, all day, people were like literally snapping my eyeballs. I, I was literally black and blue. I got pushed into a locker that day. I had food thrown at me that day. It was the worst day of my life up to that point. <laughs> I went home that day and I took off that mask. But that day I put on a different mask. This mask you couldn't see, but it was a mask of self-preservation. I made a vow to myself that day that that would never ever happen to me again. I would never be an outsider. I would never be the brunt of a joke. 
The problem is that in that, I isolated myself from who I really was. And so I learned to play the game, and you have too. I learned to play the game that when you're in certain contexts, you learn the language and you learn the jokes and you become a bit of a chameleon. You become whatever the group is around you. And so I got myself into trouble a lot because the friends I hung out with weren't exactly awesome. And even though they were doing things I didn't want to do, I so badly wanted to belong that I was willing to do them. Even if it cost me something, my integrity, my values, I was willing to compromise. And then when that didn't work, I, I tried to force myself uh, into friendships and relationships. And, and, and the tragedy is that I used the very same tactics that were used against me. I became a bit of a bully. Um, if you didn't like me, I would either physically assault you or I would verbally assault you. You know, I'd say, I'd blame you. You're like, you, you, I, you invited me to your, I invited you to my party, so I have to come to yours. I, I used manipulation and guilt. And then when those two didn't really work because I really didn't like who I was becoming, I just withdrew. I stopped engaging in conversations with people. I stopped caring because it was just too painful. It just hurt too much, so why try? And the reason I want to talk to you about this today is because my gut, my guess, is that there are many of you in this room and you're wearing a mask too. Some of you have been wearing it so long, you don't even realize it's there. It's just been welded to you. It actually has become your identity. You, you actually, when, you, when you're describing yourself to other people, you actually describe the mask because you don't even know or remember what's behind the mask anymore. And the problem with that is that you can't be fully known because you don't even know yourself. And I believe, and we believe in this church family, that you and I were created in the image of God. And because God is relational, we were designed, we were hardwired for relationship. And so these masks separate us from the very thing we need. It's why we feel lonely. It's why we could be connected to everybody through social media. You can have five million likes and be lonely. You can be in a room full of people and be lonely. You can have a family of origin and you can sit around a Thanksgiving meal and be lonely because you don't know who you are and nobody else does either. And that's a horrible feeling. So how do you change that? How do you break it? That's what I'd like to talk to you about just for the next few moments. It's the only answer is authenticity. What I'm about to talk about is countercultural. It's not easy. It's not natural. It's not even considered normal. The truth is, is you're to go to a seminar today in relationships, they'll tell you, they'll teach you how to manipulate the situation. They'll tell you how to win friends and influence people. They'll tell you how to get what you want, you know, you know, give a little caveat so you get something in return. But the Bible actually presents a completely different approach. And it's authenticity. It's getting to the place where you're fully known so that others can know you too. And this is scary. Uh, because there's a risk associated with it, and the risk is real. The cost is real. The risk is rejection. The risk is that you stick your neck out, you show yourself, and you are not accepted. That is the risk. But the reward, on the other hand, is that you can be your true self, and you can grow in space, and you can become who you were actually created to be. The other side of this taking off of the mask is true, legitimate community. It's actually what you've been looking for all your life. And so how do you get there? Well, first of all, you have to shed the mask. You have to get rid of what everyone else calls you or labels you as or has defined you as, which is very hard because it's attached to your identity, and you also have to get rid of your own expectations of what you should be. In order to get to this first step, you actually have to acknowledge that there's a God who made you and knows you, and he created you a certain way. And the only way that you can really be your true self is to figure out who he made you to be. It requires humility, an acknowledgement that you can't do it, and that you become something that you weren't designed to be. I grew up in Thailand, and one of the great things about traveling in Asia is you can buy knockoffs of everything. Uh, really, I mean, it's like it's half the price or less, and it looks almost like the real thing usually, except when they get it wrong. 
Let me, let me show you some pictures of a couple of instances where, where this has happened. Um, so you could have this very nice Abidas jersey, a uh, hoodie. Very cheap, very cheap, good price. Good price for you today. Uh, you can have this Ball Star Classic. Now that one's not too bad, because I mean, if you are a baller, I guess you, but it's supposed to be All Star Classic. Uh, you could, there's this one here, you know, Coogie. It's a very popular brand of purses right now. Everyone's, everyone has one. Uh, you could do this, you can have a pair. <laughs> which I have heard are much better than apples. And, uh, uh, and on this one, you can have a Buck Star Coffee. <laughs> It costs a buck, and you get a star. I don't know. It's a buck star coffee. And, and we laugh at this because when something is fake, it's funny because it's not the way it's supposed to be. But it's not so funny when it's you, is it? It's not so funny when you aren't who you're supposed to be. So the Bible gives us the solution and the Bible's solution is that authenticity is to be fully known and fully loved. I love the way Timothy Keller said it in that quote that we used at the sermon starter. It said, to be loved but not known is, yeah, it's comforting, but it's superficial. Yeah, you can like me or love me for what I do, but if you don't really know me, do you really love me? And to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. It's that nightmare you have, you know, of showing up in school only in your underwear. It's like, ah, I'm known, but you don't want that, right? Not to be known and not loved. So we need something bigger, something better. And so the Bible solution is found in John 3, 16, where Jesus is asked by another man, his name is Nicodemus, about this. Like, what, is real, what really matters? And Jesus answers him, for God so loved the world. When I read that passage, I put myself in the context, for God so loved Bill. He knew Bill, he knew me, he knew my mistakes, my failures. He knew everything that had been done to hurt me and everything I'd done to hurt others. And he still loved me. And he loved me so much that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that Jesus came into this world to show us what that love really looked like, that even if you had leprosy, he was willing to touch you. Even if you were a prostitute, he was willing to associate with you. If you were a tax collector, whatever you were, he was willing to be where you were too. He wasn't ashamed or embarrassed or shocked, or disgusted. Because he was willing to see you. He was willing to see past your mask. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, won't, won't, won't be locked in this isolation, but will have eternal life. And that word eternal, literally in the original language, Greek, means to have a full life, the life you were designed for. That if you're willing, there's a God who can see past your mask, who's willing to help you take it off. For he did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, not to point out your faults and failures, not to pull off the mask and make fun of what's behind it, but no, rather to save the world, to heal the world. This was God's response to our isolation. This was God's response to our pain. This was God's response to our masks, even when we built them to keep him away from us. And so today, I don't know where you're at, but... I want you to know first and foremost, if you feel like you're stuck, you've been identified, labeled, you've worn a mask, you've been isolated, cut off, don't feel like you fit in, I just want to encourage you with the truth today that there's a God who the Bible says is closer than a brother. There's a God who knows you. He knows. He knows what you did yesterday. He knows what happened to you 10 years ago. He even knows what you're going to do tomorrow. And you know the interesting thing about it? It doesn't impact how much he loves you doesn't change a thing for him. That if you're willing to just trust him and become authentic, and the first authenticity is to be honest with yourself and say, I'm not who I should be, that he's willing to heal you and set you on a new trajectory. And so today, if that's you, I want to encourage you that you can experience that. And if, if you need someone to guide you through that, maybe ask the person who brought you, or if you're watching online, interact with our online pastor, or after the experience today, find someone, go to the connections wall, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you about what that means. But for the last part of this, I want to talk about how can we be real with each other? <laughs> okay, this is the hard one. Because I've learned that we're really good at faking it with each other, and then we get mad and angry because the two masks are talking, not the real people. So how do we break that down? And I really want to practically just give you four things that I've learned in my life 
I'm no way am I saying an expert in this. Um, this is a lot of research and just hard work for me to try to figure it out because I just, I just am tired of the mask. So here's, here's what I learned. I'm going to use a part in the Bible. Um, it, it's in a book called Proverbs. So it's poetry. So it's a little tricky to unpack, but I'm going to do my best and encourage you that if you want, you can read it after and, and maybe... These steps will help alleviate some of the pressure you feel in your own relationships. So, in Proverbs chapter 27, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. If you don't, that's okay. It will be on the screen. But in Proverbs 27, verse 1, we read the first step to true true intimate relationship. It says this in 27.1, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Let someone else praise you, and not your own mouth an outsider and not your own lips. Stone is heavy and sand is a burden, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. And now, maybe you understood that. I had to actually do a little bit of work to figure out what that meant. And here's what it means in my mind. That expectations are like heavy stones. Pressure and expectations, the masks that we wear are like sand in between your toes when you're trying to walk. That there is a weight that you were not designed to carry. And it's called the expectations of others and the expectations you put on yourself. And when you believe that you're the center, whether it's through pride or whether you want others to be whatever you want them to be through envy or greed or whether you feel isolated by your pain, these are burdens that you are forced to carry that you were not designed to carry. And so they will cause incredible pain. So... The first step in any relationship, anything that isn't working, is to actually get to the root of what is really happening. My wife and I, uh, when we were first married, um, I don't know what your first year of marriage was like. Uh, it was a bit of an adjustment. I'm just going to, that's the nicest way that I can say it. Uh, there was a lot of conversation and some of it was really good and some of it was not so good. I just remember that first year, every Saturday night we had a fight. Yeah, and it was like, it was like clockwork. It was like, I could just, Saturday night, yep, we're going to fight. And I couldn't figure out why. I, you know, I thought, you know, maybe, I, I'm, I'm like, maybe she's just grumpy every, I don't know, every Saturday. But if you know my wife, she's not. That's not the case at all. And I thought, maybe I just give off some bad vibe. I don't know what it was until we got to the root. Until we were willing to actually pull off the mask and go, okay, why do we keep seeming to have these, well, she wouldn't call them arguments, because if you know Carlene, she wouldn't like that word. These disagreements, oh no, these crucial conversations, whatever you want to say, okay, that, that's what they were. Um, and, and here's what, we, what I learned, is that every Saturday morning, she woke up with a list of things to do in her head. Did I mention in her head? Did, did I, like, there, in, in there, like, and, and I, I wasn't really good at reading minds yet, and so, um, so this list would come into the world, and I would sit around and, and do what guys do. I am watch TV and, you know, I don't know. I was going to say something, but this is church. So I, I, I just thought, so the, by the end of the day, she's like, why didn't you do this? And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And so once we got to the root, it was simple. It was called our honey-do list. <laughs> Because on Saturdays, I want to do nothing. On Saturdays, she wants to do everything. And so that's just the way we're wired. It really works for us if we understand that. So on Friday night, we would go, okay, what's the to-do list for tomorrow? And the deal was, if we get all, if I get everything to do done, I can do whatever I want. It worked wonderfully. Saturday night, hockey night in Canada was amazing. I just had to get up at six to get all things done. But, uh, but... The first thing in crucial conversations is get to the root. What is really happening? And maybe you've actually never had that authentic conversation yet. Maybe you keep fighting over the same thing and actually your two masks are talking to each other. Maybe just peel them off and go, what's really happening? When you, when you say that, that really hurt me. Or when you do this, it triggers something for me. Or it's my own insecurities. And when I, when I realized my anger, you know what my anger was? I thought it was everyone else being a jerk in the world. It was actually my insecurity. Whenever I felt like I wasn't good enough, I got angry and I felt like that a lot, apparently. So, uh, right? When you can get to the root. The second thing in, in relationships and conversations is once, once you can get to the root, you need to learn how to clearly articulate your feelings. You need to learn how to clearly articulate that because people aren't very good at talking about it. We use words like, well, you always, right? Well, you, do, you don't really always. Or you never, right? We use these, these blaming, this blaming language instead of actually articulating, no, this is how I'm just feeling and I want to work this out. 
I love what it goes on to say in verse 5. Um, the, the Bible says, better is an open rebuke than hidden love. It, it's better to tell the truth because you're going to heal something than it is to hide it and cause it to go gangrene. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. The prudent see danger and they take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. The second thing is, not only do you need to get to the root, you need to clearly articulate your feelings. It's like open heart surgery. If you were to go to the doctor and that doctor really cared about you, my doctor's amazing. Um, if that doctor really cared about you, they would ask you all kinds of questions, not because they want to give you some expensive treatment or surgery, but because they want you to be healed. And, and when you go, maybe, maybe the situation is you need open heart surgery. For them to tell you that is actually a really good thing. Now, you don't let anyone rip in there and you know, cut away. You wouldn't want me to do your open heart surgery. I'd faint and you'd not be well. So that, that wouldn't be good. But, but there are certain people that you need to expose your heart to who know you and you invite to tell you the truth, even if it hurts a little bit. Right? Because sometimes the first step in healing is acknowledging the pain and dealing with the pain. And sometimes there's hard work to get out of that. So in your relationships, are you willing to get to the root? Are you willing to take off the mask? And are you willing to deal with what's underneath? This is the question that you have to ask if you want authentic relationships. And then third, you need to listen actively to hear what is really being said. This passage goes on to say, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's this image of a blacksmith, and they're pounding on a sword. And again, the pounding and the heat and the cold, all of that is to make something beautiful. So there are going to be times when there's going to be conflict. Conflict isn't bad. Conflict is actually really good. It's what you do with it and how you deal with it that determines whether it's good or bad. It's like a sword. A sword is, is okay. In a surgeon's hand, it can cut and to operate and do wonderful things. In the, in the hand of a thief or a warrior, not so much. And it's the same with our words. Our words have the power of life and death. It's not what you say all the time. It's how you say it. It's how you choose to articulate it. It's what your purpose and motivation is. I actually want you to win. So let's talk this through until we get it. Let's deal with the real issue. Let's get to the root. Let's use language that's edifying, builds up, and encourages Let's deal with this because you will be better. I love the way Brene Brown, if, if you've never encountered Brene Brown, I want to encourage you to, to get a, a hold of one of her books or watch her TED Talk. But I love what she says. She says, embrace the suck of safe and honest conversations. And in order to do that, you have to put your ego aside and actually listen. It's like that T-shirt slogan. It's the reason you have two ears and one mouth. Right? And then finally you got to develop a strategy for moving forward. Okay, so you got to learn to take off the mask. you got to get to the root, what really is happening. And you got to put yourself in an environment that's safe enough to deal with what's underneath. And then you, you, gotta, you gotta, as that process, you got to begin the healing, but then you got to figure out what's next, what's the move forward. And so he goes on figuratively in verse 18, and he says, The one who guards a fig tree will eat its fruit, and whoever protects their master will be honored. As water reflects the face... I, I love how that's kind of gone full circle for me right now in this moment, that as we take off the mask, you actually see what is there. So one's life reflects the heart. See, our challenge isn't other people. Our challenge isn't our circumstance, it's our heart. And so he says, you guard a fig tree. This, this means create safe environments. I've learned that if you want a plant to grow, you've got to plant it in a safe environment. It's got to be free from acidic soil. And in the same way, if you want to be free and authentic, you've got to release yourself from toxic people. And if you want to be in healthy relationships, you've got to be stop being a toxic person. That's how it works. And, and if I want to plant something, I've got to make sure that the soil is receptive, that there aren't thorns and other bushes that are going to push it out. You need to create safe environments. So I guess the last question I have for you is, are you a safe person? Are you a person that others can take their masks off and know that they're not going to be rejected. And if you haven't experienced that, I hope that you find a place for that to happen. And if we can, we'd love to try to be that. We're, we're not perfect, and unfortunately, we hurt people sometimes too, because hurt people hurt people. So we're trying. But I love my life group, because in my life group, it's a space where I've got enough friends, and we've 
journeyed enough along together that I can actually tell them exactly what I'm feeling and I know that I'm not going to get rejected or judged or they're not going to put expectations on me, that it's a safe place. And so today, my, my hope for you is that you would find freedom in a chameleon world. My hope for you is that you'd find freedom in an isolated world, in a world full of judgment and condemnation, that we would get back to what Jesus taught and what the story of the scriptures is all about, that you are loved just the way you are, but you're also loved too much to stay that way. That there's a God who's willing to step in and deal with the root issues and help you find a way out, and there's also a group of people. You need to build community. This is what we're trying to do here, by the way, We're not building a building. We are building a community space for people to be connected in true, authentic relationship. And it's only going to happen if we all decide to do it together. And so my hope and prayer for you today is that you'd find healing in who Jesus is and you'd find healing in a life-giving community. So God, thank you for this reminder today. I pray that I'd be the kind of person who would be trustworthy. God, help me to be authentic. Help me to be willing to continually take off my mask. Trust others. I know that it means that sometimes I'm going to get hurt. I know that. I know that sometimes it means I'm going to be misunderstood. I know that. But it's the only way for me to be truly who you created me to be. Forgive me for believing the fake, the lies what other people have said about me, or what I even think I should be. Instead, today, root me in who you say I am. I'm a child of God, created in your image, loved, valuable, created with purpose. Help me to believe that, and then help me to be the kind of person to help others believe that too, I ask, in your name. Amen. And so today, before I bless you, I just want to remind you, if we can serve you in any way, please do not hesitate to ask. And so today I bless you. I bless you with the truth that you are loved. That there's a God who created you in his image and he knows everything about you and he still chooses to love you. But he also loves you too much to leave you that way that this God is willing to step into your life and to begin to dig deep, not to hurt but to heal. And then this same God is willing to train and equip and empower you to do this for others. So please, let us do that well this week. As you go into your communities, as you go into your schools, into your homes, into your places of employment, everywhere you go, may there be a safe place for people to be authentic and receive the healing through relationship. For that's what we were created for. Live in love. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.